Hello! Following on from my recent review of Final Fantasy XVI, where I summarised aspects of the gameplay, the world, and the characters, I want to take a step forward now and start discussing some specific characters and elements of the game in depth, kicking off here with Dion Lazage. Now, Dion may seem like a, a weird one to start off with, as he only really orbits the central story, and for example, his interactions with our protagonist Clive are quite few and far between, and only really come to pass towards the end of the game. But that is in many ways precisely why I think he warrants discussion, because for a character who appears for less than a quarter of the game, Dion's story arc had a profound and lasting impression on what I and several other players took away from the game, and it's definitely worth breaking down how and why his character works so well. So, Kicking off with Dion in terms of pacing and narrative structure, I really liked how we periodically broke away from the central story and Clive's journey to delve into two other important tangents. Uh, the first one being Joshua and his journey to unveil the mysteries of Ultima, the icons, and the events that finally lead him back to Clive, and the second being Dion, who serves to show us the more tangible human conflict uh, and the tangible struggles on the ground, such as Sam Breck's war with Walud. And through this we see the trivial hubris of humans and world leaders, uh, specifically his father Sylvester, and the influence held by Ultima over human affairs, which again is viewed through the scenario of Sam Breck, and in this case more specifically uh, in the form of his young half-brother Olivier, who is a husk this empty shell that subtly holds sway over Annabella and Sylvester, or at least amplifies their own follies and insecurities and human weaknesses uh, more so than usual. And this was a great setup because while not playable characters, the reprieves into both Joshua and Dion's story gave us the ensemble feel that so many Final Fantasy games have. And for example, uh, I'm playing Final Fantasy IX at the moment, where you jump between Zidane, Vivi, and Steiner quite early on, before their stories intertwine and come together. And we essentially have the same thing in Final Fantasy XVI with these three characters, but rather than coming together within the first 30 minutes of the game, it spans a good two-thirds to three-quarters of the game before Clive, Joshua, and Dion really join forces into this sort of power team, which I think worked really well because it allowed the anticipation of these guys coming together to build up in the mind of the player before it really paid off, uh, and, and I did quite enjoy that. So I suppose a final point on structure and pace before delving into Dion specifically is that some players felt that he perhaps didn't feature enough, and I kind of understand that sentiment, but I would phrase it another way, which is to say that I wanted to see more of him. Uh, and I think there's a key difference between these two statements, because personally, I think Dion's arc was conclusive. It had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and most importantly to this end, although he featured quite sparingly in the game, he was never in a wasted moment or a throwaway scene. His story ticked along perfectly from that establishing shot where we see him battling Odin in an epic cutscene to when we see him uh, confronting his father all the way through to the showdown with Ultima and so on. So Dion's story, it had a drum-tight structure that really established him, his personality, his relationships and his obstacles, and then paid all of this off really climactically, I think, uh, towards the end. So what I mean by wanting to see more of him is in the same sense that I think about Laguna, Kiros and Ward from Final Fantasy VIII, or indeed Jekt or an Embraska from Final Fantasy X, which is to say they were all so well written and so engaging and enjoyable as characters that despite their fleeting appearances, I just wanted to be around them a little bit more uh, simply so I could enjoy them. You know, I don't think there was anything specifically wrong with the story. It was more that they were just really good characters. So moving into Dion as a, as a character now, uh, we first see him in the game as he takes to the field of battle as Bahamut to fend off Odin. And this is a fantastic establishing shot for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, we see two of the series' most celebrated legacy summons uh, clashing on screen together. But more importantly, 
I think it immediately contextualizes Dion and Bahamut in respect to and in contrast to Odin uh, and Barnabas in this game as well. And as noted in my initial review, the ominous vibe that Odin has always sort of carried with him as a summon uh, throughout the games, it's really played up to in this game, with the icon being a harbinger uh, of darkness, and indeed, you know, the elemental for darkness. While this rendition of Bahamut, which has varied between light and dark, good and bad over the years. For example, Final Fantasy XV, we could argue that Bahamut was actually slightly villainous. In Final Fantasy XVI, uh, Bahamut is posited very much as a pure and benevolent force, uh, reflecting the qualities of Dion himself. And to this end, well, I really like how they've perfectly combined various tangent Final Fantasy tropes to really create Dion and craft this sense of him. For example, uh, they've made him the dominant of the prestigious dragon king, Bahamut, but they've also made him the prestigious leader of Sambrek's dragoon class, which is not only an established Final Fantasy class, but a real-world infantry class that translates to the word dragon in Old English or Old French, so very fitting to relate and equate the dragoon class with the summoned Bahamut. Beyond this, uh, they've made him and Bahamut both clad in white, and very much aligned to the traditional element of holy in Final Fantasy as well. Though I don't think it's actually referred to in this game as holy. Uh, and finally, this aesthetic and the element you know, of holy and, and the lightness, it draws direct comparisons with the paladin class. And specifically, I think in more ways than one, Dion really recalls elements of that famous protagonist of Final Fantasy IV, uh, which is Cecil Harvey, who likewise embodies a certain virtuousness in his aesthetic and his demeanour that sees him transition and wrestle between you know, the dark and the light over the course of his own story. Uh, and I'll touch on this more shortly because I think Dion does follow in these footsteps as well. So in all, I think Dion carries these different elements of Final Fantasy really well and they effortlessly combine and chime with his personality from his opening appearance to help craft this idea of a noble and empathetic character and it's easier said than done, I think, because often uh, sincere and noble and formal characters can come across as a bit hammy and a bit stereotypical. So I think it's a big credit to how they handled Dion. Um, everything from the voice acting through to the aesthetics, the body language uh, and his ultimate delivery. And the idiosyncrasies that were particular to this character that really emphasised these traits. For example, one of my personal favourites is that he always refers to other dominants by their icon names, uh, such as calling Clive Ifrit, calling Joshua Phoenix, and that sort of thing, which really emphasises this knightly formality uh, that he has, uh, so I love that. Now, taking a step forward to Dion's actual story, it goes without saying that he is a tragic character, and indeed, in a game that is already steeped in personal tragedy, whether it's Elwyn or Benedicta or Clive, you know, the bearers and so on, I think Dion's tragic arc is among the most poignant in the game, and one of my favourite tragic characters in Final Fantasy to date, I think. And the reason for this, which I did touch on in my review of the game, is where Final Fantasy's tragic characters often either go down a road of ruin because of some personal flaw, like pride or insecurity, uh, like Cypher in Final Fantasy VIII, for example, or they become antagonists because of some uncontrollable external event that's happened to them, like Dine from Final Fantasy VII, or perhaps even Seymour and Sephiroth as other examples. I think Dion stands out and profoundly affects us as players, because at least from a moral perspective, rather than doing anything wrong, he sort of did everything right, and yet still ended up in ruin, uh, losing everything that he loved. So, very much like a Shakespearean tragedy, where a series of small unfortunate and sometimes unconnected events, misinterpretations and miscommunications build up and combust with devastating results, whether that's Romeo and Juliet or Princess Cordelia in King Lear, which is quite fitting because Sylvester is very much a King Lear sort of character. We are left with this sort of bleak sadness that characters like Dion were almost collateral damage. Uh, they came undone for having had the best intentions and the best moral compass of all of those around them. Now, to this end, uh, I think they built the scenes between Dion, Annabella and his father really well, 
And actually, despite being in some of the coolest action sequences in the game uh, as Bahamut, I think the scenarios in the throne room where Dion is frequently trying to talk his father around and make him see sense about the overkill of unleashing Bahamut against his unwitting enemies. These were really strong scenes, I think, and they immediately contrasted and emphasised the attributes and differences between Sylvester's stubbornness uh, and lust for power, which clashed with Dion's chivalry and sense of rightness, which in turn prompts the latter's inner conflict, where he is forced to choose between morality and the rule of law, you know, the word of the instructions uh, of his father. And everything from the dialogue itself to the progressive capitulation of Dion, where his father is literally forcing him down onto one knee in deference, I think it really established the relationship and the rising conflict and the raising stakes in that relationship quite well. And I suppose as an aside, uh, when it comes to Dion's father, there has been ongoing questions and speculation around whether he's always been a bit of a tyrant or to what extent he's been influenced to become this way. Um, and for my part, I think it's a scenario that's not too dissimilar from Lord of the Rings, uh, where we have the bewitched King Theoden of Rohan, who's been corrupted by the infiltrator of Wormtongue on behalf of Soromam, because the game quite clearly states that he's not directly under Ultima's influence, nor does it state that he has always coveted power or been tyrannical, because Dion actually says in the game that his father has changed. So I suppose the real question is where does Ultima end and Annabella begin? Because where Annabella covets power and legacy in a very elitist, pure-blooded way, Ultima is of course the overarching villain that inhibits the empty shell of Olivier, and so has access to both Sylvester and Annabella for his own ends. So personally, I would suspect that, like all corruptors, or all corrupted, Ultima is taking advantage of human weaknesses that already exist. So for example, we know that Sylvester fears for his people and his empire because of the spreading blight, and having been corrupted, he seeks to expand into other territories, which is a combination, I think, of Ultima and Annabella's influence. But, Sedgway aside, uh, let's get back to Dion, and this impossible situation that he finds himself in, which is heightened by Sylvester abdicating the throne in favour of Olivier, is the impetus for Dion's tragedy, and in his pivotal but fatal chivalric act, he chooses to spare the lives of hundreds if not thousands of enemy soldiers on the field of battle, and attempts to salvage Sambrek by murdering his brother Olivier, uh, which he fails to do and inadvertently kills his father instead. So once more, a very Shakespearean tragic moment that is not dissimilar to scenes that we do see in Shakespeare that sends Dion into this anguished rage, destroying his own city as Bahamut, uh, which eventually brings him into the fold with Clive and Joshua. And I can only speak for myself here, but the way that they had built Dion up to this point, where he really was this pragmatic good guy that we were rooting for, when I saw the scene cut to Bahamut raising the city to the ground, and my heart actually sank because this character had towed the line. He had lived by such a strong moral code for so long and was one of the few rays of hope in Valisthea, I think. And then he completely unraveled, uh, and I did expect him to die in a boss fight at this point because it definitely felt like he'd reached a point of no return and enacted things that he couldn't come back from. But I'm glad he didn't, because it took his story into a new, um, still tragic, but much more redemptive direction, um, introducing these formative relationships with Clive, with Joshua, with the medicine girl, and so on. And actually, one of my favourite lines in the game that really stuck with me is, after learning that he's alive uh, and unconscious, Clive says something like, No wonder he hasn't stirred. I would be afraid to wake. And I love that line because it really emphasises what Dion's actually unwittingly done, uh, and it emphasises this tragic pivot in his story where he's committed patricide, he's lost his city, and essentially everything he holds dear uh, in a moment of rage and weakness. So, in all, uh, the journey that ushers Dion into the endgame and into the final stanza with Clive and Joshua was excellent in my opinion, and as has been commented elsewhere, 
it's interesting how he contrasts with Clive in many ways, with the, f- with the latter, sorry, being driven by revenge initially, uh, and with the other, Dion, being this conventional prince charming sort of knight. Uh, but by the final act of the game, with each of them having lost everything in their own way, they become aligned in their end goal and in their temperament, which to my mind is a very fatalistic temperament, uh, very resigned to what they consider should be their self-sacrifice, and yet in in its own way quite a beautiful and ambitious last stand, because although they're willing and they expect to not survive, they're doing so in order to see the world change for the better. And through Dion specifically, who I think has one of the more theorised upon and thought-provoking story arcs and, and secondary stories in the game, we see him focusing on helping, for example, the little medicine girl as a form of penance, uh, and also go around offering his farewells, as if already accepting his demise. And I think the most emotive of these is with Terence. Again, as I mentioned in my earlier review of the game, there's a lot of potent emotional scenes in this game. And I think the one where Dion bids farewell to his lover, uh, Terence, and, and sends him away almost as an excuse to go and help this medicine girl, this was one of the most emotional scenes for me, because... It's almost the, it's unspoken, but it's almost the elephant in the room between them that they're not going to see one another again, and, and Dion's probably going to die. So, excellent little dialogue exchange there. So, drawing to a narrative close now, uh, barring a small opportunity to squeeze a bit more Dion from the story, uh, which is the side quest uh, tale to tell, the end game does indeed show the ultimate showdown with Ultima, in which Ifrit, Phoenix, and indeed... Dion as Bahamut are sacrificed to save the world. And it's a beautiful sequence, and and, and by this point in the game, there's nothing better than seeing Clive, Joshua, and Dion combine as this super iconic team, no pun intended. But as I say, there there has been speculation around whether Dion is actually dead, um, and these other tangents of his story, such as whether the medicine girl is significant, uh, she's been theorised as Leviathan, for example, or the dominant of Leviathan, Uh, whether or not Terence has survived, and and all these various things. So much of the speculation is being fuelled, and and much desire for DLC or further context is being fuelled by the second story of Final Fantasy XVI, which is that of Dion. And coming full circle to my earlier point, I love this because, as with Laguna from Final Fantasy VIII, and as with Jekt from Final Fantasy X, it is precisely the evidence of a well-written but sparingly utilised character that encourages this sort of discussion uh, and these sorts of wants from players. And while I would personally be contented if Dion's story was conclusive, uh, as it is at face value, because after all the death and destruction and indeed the things that he he did do as a tragic character, it does make sense ultimately that he may want and indeed have fallen on his sword. Having said that, I would definitely be open to narrative continuity or indeed narrative backstory if they were to extend aspects of the game and I think Dion would be an excellent character to do that with and precisely the reason I wanted to discuss Dion first in my character discussions is this speculation and lasting impression that this character has left because he was ultimately so brilliantly written I think um, if fleetingly seen in Final Fantasy 16. So if you got this far uh, thanks very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Feel free to drop a comment below letting me know your thoughts on Dion in Final Fantasy 16, and if you enjoyed the episode and you haven't already, please consider subscribing and reading the description below to see how else you can support.